Boom. An explosion. Not an explosion, an event. What did it sound like? There was no one there to hear it. What did it look like? There was no one there to see it. When was it? It created time. Where was it? It invented space. To explain in rhyme, it's space time. And you and I are born to face time and space. Some 14 billion years ago, long before I was born, nothing became something in a vast burst of energy. A new dawn exploded in mystery so sublime, even I can't understand it. But it started space and time. Clouds and gases formed then and spread like peanut butter that covers my morning bagel but would have left me in utter disbelief that could have ruined my entire morn, but it was 15 billion years ago, long before I was born. Those gaseous clouds then coalesced and drifted together to form a thermonuclear quagmire of a great unbounded storm of energy that roared and smashed and rolled about to bang and batter like waves upon the stormy sea creating what we call matter. But I'm only recounting what I've read. I really have to warn you. It was 14 billion years ago, long before I was born. Black holes then and galaxies massed in clusters of gas coalesced into stars and suns and planets dividing the void and the mass. In the midst of an insignificant gal galaxy, one tiny star exploded, bursting into the stratosphere, an explosion that was loaded with tiny masses of matter that banded together, and for whatever it may be worth, it formed the tiny planet, the home that we call Earth. Then a comet or an asteroid delivered oceans of ice, which cooled it down considerably, making it rather nice. Then from the depths of the water, then from the store source of the strife, then from the inner core of the energy came the mysterious emergence of life. Or perhaps from the burst of a comet, or was it from a boiling pool, or maybe God made us. That's what I learned in Sunday school. How he sent us descending like royalty from heavens in his image, good heavens, a microcosm of the cosmos itself. We had the keys to the kingdom to rule the land and the seas. Or, as the result of binomial distribution, we may have developed by evolution. One-celled creatures expanding, merging, complicating, moving about, freestanding, mating, replicating, fins which vanquished the water became legs on which to stand, and those multifaceted organisms walked upon the land. There they grew and they prospered through meeting adversity, creating a chain of life that traversed the land and the air and the sea. And on the land, the plants began to grow, ferns became trees, crawling animals climbed their trunks, they ranged the land and the seas, tails became feet, fins became hands, and the apes climbed down from the trees as they discovered they could stand and see out over the grass to conquer the land. When they discovered fire, such new things they could eat, then they invented the spear and learned they could kill their meat. Till in a flash of growth, the brain expanded in the creature from the savanna, leading to tools and philosophy and cultivation of the banana. They prospered and they propagated to such a successful degree, creating a chain of life that covered the land and the sea. By the laws of unnatural selection, they created diversity and light-skinned complexion. As the Bible says, they began to beget. Oh, Lord, how they begat and begat. No manuals were needed then. It wasn't long after when, with all their begatting, they ruled the earth, amen, amen. And then, who was the first human being who killed another? The Bible says that Cain killed Abel, which sealed man's fate. Was it over a mate, territory, what they ate? For along with the begetting came a constant letting of blood. On the shores of Lake Chokana, on a long lost Kenyan lagoon, were found 27 ancient cell skeletons strewn about. They'd been tied and they'd been murdered and left unburied in the sand, an ancient massacre calcified to help us all to understand. 
to help us all to understand, to help us all to know that we were killing one another 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, my friends, 10,000 years ago, we were killing one another 10,000 years ago. How many wars? How many humans butchered? How many gallons of blood shed? How many walked among the dead before the written word could even record them? Only after the invention of writing could such records begin. From the first recorded war in Mesopotamia around 3000 BC, men have slaughtered each other since then for little reason other than vanity. Nobody knows, but it's been said, there are between 140 million and a billion estimated dead. Through Phoenicians, pictographs, Egypt's pyramids to the philosophers of Greece, slaughter raged endlessly between brief moments of peace. Ah, the philosophers of Greece, wandering through the olive groves of Athens, peacefully pondering each lofty thought, while a fleet of ships ranged the Mediterranean Sea, bringing back the products of the known world, the grains they grew, the fish they caught, the ideas they thought. This navy was supported by the mines from the nearby mountains of Laurium, where 20,000 slaves worked 12 hours a day in conditions inhumane, recovering flint deep within the vein of the pit of heat and smoke that was the mine, which collapsed so often on the miner taking his life, but when that was the miner's lot, while through it all the philosophers below drifted about on their clouds of lofty thought. Happily, the land was filling. Happily, we were begatting faster than we were killing. Through ceaseless war, endless combating, God willing, kill, 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 but keep begatting. Through the Roman Empire, through the Dark Ages, and the Enlightenment and the plagues, through the Inquisition and the Crusades, in the French salons, between the chatting, they were really just begatting. What would start as friendly padding would lead to ever more begatting. Through hate and war and great disaster, the begattings just got faster. Combatings and begattings and a never-ending chase till finally we won the race, and that's how we conquered the entire place. There has always been a conqueror and a conquered, those who lose and those who win. This tale of woe from a land of plenty we shall hear again and again and again. We lived by Ten Commandments. They told us a lot about God, how he made the earth and all it was worth, anything for man to exploit, and we were so adroit at doing so. Those commandments say nothing about caring for the soil or the waters or the animals that lock the land or the fish that swim in the sea. They were all made for the use of God's special children. That was you and me. And oh, did we use it. We cut the forest and plowed the fields to flow our water to move our trucks. We built the roads and aqueducts to take us to far-flung places, leaving a river of trash to trace us. But, it, but life pretty much stayed the same until the Industrial Revolution came. Great monsters of machines were devised and armies of workers spent their entire lives behind those dirty, dirty, greasy, noisy machines until they became part of them, the heart of them. And then came electricity and the world lit up with new powers. People could work longer hours, but we all had shirts and shoes, many of us that is. For we also developed the concept of the many's and the few's. Marconi invented the radio to bring culture to the people of the world. The symphony, the orchestra, the concert, the play to isolated peoples in lands far away. And it all seemed so good so someone had the brilliant idea that it could also be used to sell us, to tell us of cigarettes and cereals, of soaps and deodorants, of automobiles and drugs, preying on our ignorance, and then to take it to a higher level. Television popped in to further bedevil us into a life of pomposity, of such grandiosity. We put aside all inhibition to live a life of acquisition, of toasters and roasters, dices and slices, washers and dryers, humidifiers and more TVs. Be devil as you say, weed killer, bug spray, fertilizer, moral decay, chemicals to cure us of the ills they give us, creating needs then offering to fulfill us, 
fake people selling evening fake products, a compendium of diversions and deceits, baubles and trifles, bombs and rifles, destroying the earth for temporary treats, the primeval forest cut into toilet seats. We invented gears and drills and wagons and pills, but mostly we invented money. Money that was seashells, money that was gold, money that was silver, money that was paper, money that was digital information. Finally, to money that is an idea, an idea of make-believe. As long as people believe in the make-believe, the make-believe is real. But reality was gone. Like the emperor's new clothes, we were strutting about with nothing on. Television encouraged us to buy, buy, buy. So we printed more money to buy more stuff. Television encouraged us to buy, 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 so we printed more money to buy more stuff. Television encouraged us to buy, 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 afraid that people would lose faith in the money. We showed, slowed the printing presses. We invented credit cards, and we all went into debt. Now, anything we wanted, we could get. Rise up, people, rise up and sing. Now everybody can have everything. And television encouraged us to buy, buy, buy. We bought ourselves into damnation. We would be the final generation. We filled our lives with stuff, stuffing stuff everywhere, never enough stuff. And when we no longer have enough room for our stuff, we find a rental unit. Cheap money led to cheap credit, led to cheap labor, led to cheap goods. The extraction industries thrived around the globe. Mountains were leveled, the rivers were dammed to fill our dumps with goods no longer in fashion. We cleared the hilltops, we paved the lands, we trashed the lakes and gutted the fields, lined the roads with fast food restaurants and inconvenience stores, and the roadsides with plastic bottles, plastic bags, plastic cups, plastic straws, plastic forks, and plastic spoons. That was freedom. Complete freedom to fill the ocean with trash. Complete freedom to saturate the air with smoke. Complete freedom to fill the minds of children with violence and their overweight diabetic bodies with sugar. Freedom. We were enslaved by freedom. When the internet arrived, it was accepted to connect us. How could we have known the weird way it would affect us? It carefully connected us, yes, with those with whom we agree. Bonding a you and me while creating another entity, the them, and then. We hated them as we were sure they hated us, and as words became walls, effectively, the internet separated us. Nothing was any worse. With only credit and cheap dollars, we scoured the earth, we destroyed the oceans, we destroyed the nation, we raped our future generation. And through it all, we kept begatting the conquering and the chases, the midnight embraces, Till we were seven billion strong. Seven billion strong cutting the forest, seven billion strong taking the fish from the ocean, seven billion strong mining the minerals, seven billion strong driven for the oil, seven billion strong singing a song of conquest, seven billion strong living in the dream that we could go on this way forever. So civilization and culture conquered the land and the sea, stumbling along through the centuries leading to you and me. Sitting here in our cushion chairs, posturing and preening, discussing the implications of whether it has any meaning. But somewhere deep within, a malignant black humor, recalling yesterday's dreams of glory, asked, today am I merely a consumer? Living a life that is unsustainable to follow a dream that is unattainable, will I have the distinction of being the cause of the sixth extinction. Now, with 85 years in hand, I look at my own, my native land. I see it happening. I see 5% of the world's population are responsible for 25% of the consumption. The 5% of the Earth's population responsible for 25% of the pollution, 25% of the waste. I see a million plastic bags every minute, and every one of those million bags can break into 1.75 million micro components, which are consumed by birds, fish, lizards, mammals, and us. I see 55 million plastic coffee pods every day. I see 20,000 single-use drinking bottles every second. If everyone on Earth consumed at the rate that Americans do, it would take three and a half Earths 
to sustain us. Add to that two million Pearsons in prison, the highest rate in the world, predominantly black, many in for-profit prisons, and constitutionally legal slaves. I see unprecedented inequality, where 1% of the population control 40% of the resources. I see 50 years of unending wars with few, if any, tangible results other than the creation of multi-billionaires and violent religious cults, who both understand clearly, with wisdom quite Confucian, that war, for all its inconveniences, is a profit-making institution, and more nukes. I have seen endless enemies created from all sides to stun the public into submission. Communist, terrorists, Taliban's gays, radical Islamist, ISIS, Asians, Jews and blacks, atheists, Presbyterians, Catholic, Baptist, Mexicans, Unitarian. Is this the way the world ends? Making enemies when we could be making friends? Each day a new villain surrounds us, confusion swirl around us. My friends, we are in a moral crisis. We face doomsday and wonder what the price is. In predicting the apocalypse, scientists and preachers agree. It could be God, disease, or climate change, but most likely it's you and me. What a terrible, ironic, cosmic joke if the universe ran amok and created the first intelligent beings with a built-in self-destruct. Like lemmings going off over the cliff, and we all knew it as the final scene in Easy Rider put it. You know, Billy, we blew it. Those words echo in my mind. You know, Billy, we blew it. We all know what we have to do. We just don't want to do it. We don't want to stop driving our cars. Our shopping is too important. We don't want to give up that vacation flight. We work hard day and night. We bottled water and plastic bags are awfully handy. We have a right, like kids, to candy. So we'll toast our luck, a smoke a joint, and cruise on through the tipping point. I wish I could give you more hope, my friends. I can't pretend to be the whiz. All that I can truthfully tell you is it is what it is. It is what it is, my final task I'm born to ask to end my dog verse. Is there any purpose in our lives, or is it a clockwork universe? I think that I can safely say without fear of correction, though we may not have purpose, we seem to have direction. But there's an even greater mystery. Am I the conscious receiver? Science now tells me it can't exist without me as the perceiver. Do my eyes make it visible? Do my ears make it heard? Does my touch make it tactile? Does it respond to my word? Does my mind create me standing here regurgitating the books upon my shelf? Finally, am I the universe investigating itself? So we face with fear or courage a future quite unknown. And as for purpose, well, we have to make our own. Intelligent creatures we, will we set the earth ablaze? Are we doomed to self-extinction? Or can we change our ways? We know our years are numbered, though we don't know the plan, so we plunge forward day by day, doing the best we can, avoiding ultimate questions. Wherein lies the source? If this is a dream we are dreaming, can we change its course? But I leave more questions than answers, with reason totally forsworn, for it all happened 14 billion years ago, long before I was born.